Hi, this is Zoe Routh, and this is Thought Nugget number two. I promised a review of Surrounded by Idiots by Thomas Erickson. Is it a hit or a miss? Well, it's a hit and a miss. It's all a bit contextual. If you know DISC, uh, which is the one of the fundamental models underpinning the whole book that he does give reference to, then you're not going to get a lot out of this book. Uh, it covers the fundamentals. So if you know DISC because you've done it before, you're a facilitator with it, you can probably give this one a miss. If you have never come across behavior preferences before and you want a simple people reading tool, then yeah, sure, go for it. This is a great little handbook. It'll give you some fundamentals that are evergreen. So in that way, it's a hit. The link will be in the show notes. And now on to today's big juicy question. Should you give anonymous feedback? And let me be honest here, it's a bit of a rant. So uh, just be patient with me. This came, this thought was launched by uh, Marty Fisk, who's the CEO of Men's Link, sent me an article uh, on LinkedIn by somebody who purported to advocate for giving anonymous feedback. And he went through this entire article and at the end in his byline, and by the way, I I own a startup that has an application that allows for anonymous feedback. And I thought, oh, that's a bit disingenuous, isn't it? You steer, you steer the entire conversation to set him up for it. And by the way, we have the solution. I think he genuinely believes in it. However, I do not. <laughs> I was almost outraged by the suggestion that it could be a good thing. So, And yet I've sort of calmed down a little bit. I think there are a couple of instances where it is okay and possibly even useful to have anonymous feedback. Otherwise, no, let's talk about why. The main premise is if you need the feedback to be anonymous, then there's a problem that needs fixing. (laughs) Because if people don't feel safe enough to give feedback, then there's a problem in the culture, whether it's a problem with individual managers or more broadly, or they're, they're afraid of repercussions of some sort, and that is not healthy. So if you, it's basically a symptom. If you need to have an anonymous survey around what's happening in your culture, you have a problem already. Okay, so let me just unpack what you should be doing instead. Uh, by the way, that happened to a couple of organizations I've been working with where they knew there was a problem and they sent out a culture survey. But in both instances, they hadn't really done a thorough look at whether or not the results could be guaranteed to be anonymous. In other words, there is mechanisms mechanisms within the distribution or the questions that would zero in and be able to point out who said what. And so basically the response rate on both in both organizations to the survey was pretty poor because people knew they could be singled out and therefore the repercussions they were afraid of could get acted on. So, aha, uh-huh, big red flag. If you have a need to fix your culture, and you know because you've, you feel like you need to do an anonymous survey, there's a couple of things you need to think about doing as interventions. And the survey on its own will not fix these. The first thing is at the top of the iceberg, if we look at a layered, layered level of interventions, the kind of superficial immediate piece, which is really useful, is giving people feedback skills. There is an art and a craft and a structure to it. You don't just wing it. And most people just either dodge feedback or slap it on the table too roughly. It needs care and it needs thought and it needs craft. So that's the first thing. You need to make sure that people are empowered with the soft skills, the people skills of giving effective feedback. Second thing, next layer down, is you need to go to work on your relationships. If people are afraid to give feedback, what's going on in the dynamics? And there's three things that you need to look at when it comes to the relationships in micro teams and in bridge cultures between teams and across the whole organization. What is the structure of the teams? How are decisions made? Is it clear who's responsible for what? Is there an accountability cadence and structure? What are the strengths of each te- of each team member and are they being leveraged to the utmost of their capacity? And lastly, do they have the difficult conversation skills they need in order to resolve issues? So there's a lot of work that goes on to in, into these relationships. If you want to take a deeper dive, check out my, my third book, Loyalty, and it gives you a whole range of things that you can do to establish uh, effective teams, boundless teams, and making sure that that relationship piece is sound on an ongoing basis. 
The next layer down is dealing with systems. Systems often create tensions in relationships. So if you've got tension in relationships, have a look at your systems. Your remuneration st- uh, system, your promotion system, your task allocation system, any system that has to do with people interacting with each other, does it cause friction or is it smooth and has flow? When you do an audit of your systems, you can often fix a couple of procedural things and that will free up the tension in relationships. It's kind of like we're doing a downstream or upstream of look at what's going on in your culture. And the next layer down from systems are your values. Do you have a clearly articulated set of values on which everything else is based? Are those values articulated into observable, practical, pragmatic behaviors that people know? Are those pragmatic behaviors then translated into a manifesto that it's easy to remember that people can anchor and refer back to? Remember that systems are values made visible. So if you've got problem in your systems, then possibly you've got some articulation or lack of clarity or lack of accountability around your values and your behavior. So do that kind of work uh, up front. Okay, so that's the work that you should be doing before you launch into an anonymous feedback survey thing. So when should you have a survey done that's anonymous? I already mentioned it. One, one, uh, one case is if you know you have problems in your culture, in which case make it absolutely rock solid and certain that nobody can be traced. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get dishonest feedback or people are going to skip the survey altogether. Now, the second piece is, a, is some insight I got from an upcoming guest on the podcast, Chris Dyer when I asked him about this anonymous feedback, because it's been like irksome for me. And he said one of, the, one of the reasons or platforms or timings when it's important that you do actually provide anonymous feedback platforms for f- people is for whistleblower protections. So if someone is genuinely concerned about repercussions, um, like a whistleblower, then you absolutely must have a vehicle where people can air their grievances and bring to light issues that are of concern to them, to their peers, to the organization, or to the broader community without getting vilified. And we've seen in the media lots of incidents where uh, whistleblowers are vilified, and you really do put your neck on the line to be a truth teller. So we need to honor those people and give them a vehicle in order to report uh, what they see as genuine concerns. Now, there's pros and cons to this because can you verify what they say? Is what they say uh, logical? Not logical, but you know, verifiable. That's probably the best analogy. If they raise a concern, can you do anything about it? It might be they might be raising a rumor as opposed to clear evidence. So that's one of the tensions within. Doesn't matter. Having a vehicle where someone can raise issues is helps give transparency to what's going on in the culture. So there you have it. Two places where you might consider having anonymous feedback. Otherwise don't do it. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's it from me this week. If you've got concerns about the people stuff in your organization, or you want to amp up your people stuff skills, reach out to me. Let's chat. It's the work that I absolutely love and adore. And I'd love to hear from leaders who are as excited and fascinated and obsessed with doing the people stuff better and well. That's you, zoe at intercompass.com.au. In the meantime, live well, lead well.